Hello, welcome to Furious Driving and welcome to this, our monthly post bag junk in the trunk feature of stuff that people have sent into the channel to talk about and show and tell. Uh, a bit like Gallery on, or The Gallery on Take Heart many, many years ago. I'll apologise right now, I've had a cold this week and I have my uh, second injection jab thing so I'm a bit under the weather so bear with me if I'm a bit croaky and a bit slow and more mumbly than usual but we'll crack through. I'll just say before we begin, Furious Driving mugs are available in the links in the description below from Redbubble as are the Quentin t-shirts, although the Quentin t-shirts are going to be very retro and OG very soon because obviously Quentin's getting painted so the red uh, wing is not going to be a thing for too long. So get them while you can. I'm going to have to redraw this without the red wing, which is a shame. We'll get the car wrapped with a, with a, a red vinyl wing. Now that distressed creaking can tell us only one thing. I'm going to fish a letter out the back of the car. The dear old Rover V8. First of all, it's an actual letter, an actual genuine letter. There are, of course, Q&A questions and answers sent in by Patreons and channel members, which we'll answer in a second as well. There's no money in it. That's a shame. But there is Star Wars letter writing paper, so that's always a good start. Ah, okay, this is an offer of a car uh, to review, so I, <laughs> uh, I will file that and answer you later. Star Wars paper is always a good thing. Now, next up we have something, something uh, flat and thin, which appears to have come from Germany. Allow me to get my knife out and see what we can see. Many bits of cardboard. The recycling people love me. Ooh, number plates. That's some pretty cool cardboard there, actually. We have a German number plate. Fantastic. If you may recall, I have done a shout out to try and build a wall of global number plates. So far, we've got the UK, Holland, America, and Australia on the wall, I think, from memory. Is there Canada on there as well? I don't I'm sure. But yes, this is a German plate now. We've not got a German one yet. This is awesome. Uh, what's our covering note in here? Hi Matt, here is my old plate from a much loved but long gone Fiat Coupe 20 valve. Oh, a Coupe 20 valve. B is from Berlin. If, I'm not really that familiar with the German um, numbering, number plating system, so that's cool to know. Um, thanks for all the content and look forward to seeing progress on, on the V8. Best from Jason. Thank you, Jason. That is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I need to learn more about how the, uh, the German plate system works. I didn't know that B, or well, the first letter stood for the city it came from. I do like Germany, it's a nice, company, nice country to visit actually. So that will be going up on the wall. I think it hasn't got screw holes, so that's going to be awkward to mount that. I'm going to have to use gluey things or something. That's cool. Thank you, that's brilliant. So, in case you've not followed this already, over the last couple of episodes of the monthly uh, Junk in the Trunks, I've been collecting global number plates. I'm going to try and get a wall with a plate from every country in the world that issues plates. I mean, it's going to be a big wall in the end, but yeah, you, you fantastic people are making this possible. I'm making this. That's very creaky. A lot of fun. Now we have Furious Driving Junk in the Trunk. If you want to send stuff in, this is the address. PO Box 477 Aylesford ME69 LE. This has been going on a couple of months now, long enough now that the woman in the post sorting office actually recognises me now. This is kind of like Christmas every month, but with only car related stuff. So it's kind of better than Christmas, really. And I have started sharing these things on Instagram and Facebook and that kind of stuff. Oh. Oh, ha, ha, ha. Oh, that's funny. Following all our minder escapades, straight up the autobiography of Arthur Daly. Where would this country be without men like Arthur Daly? Signed, Derek Trotter. If you're not from the UK, Derek Trotter was an even more Arthur Daly character from another TV show called Only Force Nosses. Ha ha ha! To furious driving with warmest regards from your mortal enemy, Gregoire! Watch out for a new YouTube coming soon. Oh, Gregoire, you're not opening a rival YouTube channel, are you? Complete with bookmark. <laughs> <laughs> that is very funny. Thank you, Gregoire. <laughs> I'll remove your batteries for the Wisco Lay one day in revenge for that. <laughs> that is very funny. I've, I've bedtime reading in Shea Furious. Right, we have a large box now. I did open this to make sure it was stuff that I was expecting to come. Uh, first of all, much, much packaging. 
I did know this was coming. Um, I was to make sure it had arrived safely and was what I was expecting. This is from uh, Maxidine in the comments. Gideon, hello. Hey, some small gifts from northern parts of the Netherlands. Sadly, the last package got lost. Yeah, we, he emailed to say it, it was on the way and it never arrived. Didn't go back to him either. So somewhere in the post is some interesting stuff. So if you're somewhere in the postal system between the UK and the Netherlands, there's a box of cool things floating around. I've included some car brochures me and my dad collected since the 80s until his death. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, fond memories of all the Saturdays we've spent together going to all the dealers. I remember the Austin one well. Let's have a look through and see what we've got in here. There's some interesting stuff he did talk to me say was coming over. First of all, I'm quite excited because I've not been able to find this in a breaker's yard over here yet. This hopefully should be the door lens for my Volvo 740. There is a, a open door red light on those cars for so a safety thing and it's missing its little lens. And that hopefully will be the little lens to fix that. So we shall see, I'll put that there for now. Oh, 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 and Sweden badges. Now, should these go in place of my um, my prancing moose badges on the flanks of the car, or maybe on the boot somewhere? That's quite cool. A little self-adhesive. Oh, I'll show you the, the light first as well. That's a little a lamp lens, but astonishingly hard to find. When I went to um, Lakes Volvo up on the A1, every single 700 and 900 had had these removed, <laughs> regardless if nothing else had been taken off the car, those lenses were gone. And these are little Sweden badges. They are very, very cool indeed. We do have a bit of Swedish. I'm actually doing Swedish on Duolingo at the moment. That Volvo is influencing my life. What else have we got? Ah, Montego badge. We'll find somewhere to stick a Montego badge up here in the garage. We'll stick it someplace, someplace fun. We like a stuff, decorating stuff. Then we have the brochures. Oh, hang on, there's more stuff before we get the brochures. This, I opened this up and I thought, why has he sent me a distributor cap with no, no leads on it? It's a um, oil filter removal tool. I, I apparently he's had, um, had a couple of these in the garage, this was spare. That could actually be quite handy. I've got a different kind of one, which is like a, a graspy thing, which I used in the last Volvo video. So that could be quite a useful thing to make my life easier. Finally, we have brochures, and brochures are fantastic. I do love an old brochure because they just are a glimpse into a bygone world. And we'll start off with the Montego Maestro mini brochure. I've not actually looked at this yet. I opened the box to check it had arrived safely. Didn't open the brochures. So we'll look at this together. So first of all, Montego, a brave new hope. Check out the Montego estate. Now, all, all Montego estates weren't countrymen, were they? The countryman was a specific model of Montego, I believe. And of course, this is all in, uh, in, in Dutch. I won't try and read it and put on the accent because that would just be terrible. Oh, Montego, two litre D saloon, GTI saloon. And the Maestro, we did review a Maestro on here, oh, about 18 months, two years ago. One of the first real nicer reviews I did. It was just before I bought the, uh, it was the last review I did on my old Fuji camera before I realized that the microphone wasn't working properly on it. Metro, these are all cars. I've sat in many of them, and I know lots of people have got them. I've never owned. Bizarrely, MG Metro, the MG Metro, a very cool car, very, much of its time. I'm hoping this camera is focusing on this stuff. Um, years ago, back in the 90s, a friend of mine, well, my boss actually, bought an MG Metro for his wife for a birthday present, but it was stolen before he gave it to her. And the police rung to say they'd recovered it, or found it, I should say, not even recovered it. So he drove up to, to go and collect where they said it had been found, and it had been re-stolen before he even collected it. So he, his wife never saw the car. Mini, this is, must be in the very, very, very end of the minis. This must be in, in the mid to late 90s, I guess. Or early 90s, I, perhaps. There's not a year on this. There's all the, the full specification. I do like full specifications, because that means I can refer to them in videos later on. Oh, that's really cool. Let's put that somewhere safe for a minute. Now this is cool, this is very much up my street. Alpha 156 pre-facelift brochures. Let's do the 156 saloon first of all. And that it, if that's not the prettiest saloon car you've ever seen, I do not know what is. I mean, seriously, that the lines on the 156 were absolutely perfect. What a nice interior, no seats. I had mine for five years and those, I've never sat in a car as comfortable regardless of the, of the price. No matter how long or hard a day I'd had at work, just sink into those seats and everything was right with the world. And of course, it was one of the, the last cars to get the, the twin spark engine in it as well. I must, 
I must add a 156 to the collection before too long. Well, there are still some around. And this, of course, is the sport wagon. Famously, the sport wagon of the 156 was actually smaller boot capacity than the saloon, bizarrely. Um, again, a great looking car. It's a car that works well. I think it works better as a saloon, but as an estate, it still does look really good. Same amazing interior. Obviously very lifestyle because Italian. What a great looking car. I'm gonna have to go and run this through Google Translate later on because this is such a cool looking thing. Again, this obviously would have to be from the, I guess, well, very late 90s into the early noughties being a pre-facelift 156. When was the facelift? It's 2003. I think the facelift car only ran until 2005. From memory, I've done no research here, so I should have done some. Right, so I'm not quite sure where this has come from. This is addressed to Mr. Furious at Furious Driving, and it feels soft. It hasn't got a wish return address on it. The surname is driving on this, which amuses me greatly. This would appear to be a large coverall. Hang on, is there a instructions here oh gosh i've got 20 oh sorry 75 pounds of wine if i go and buy some i think i might have buy more than 75 pounds of worth of wine to actually achieve that mad for tools i don't know mad for tools if you are mad for tools then thank you for this I'm trying to find a name to say thank you to max max hello thank you very much indeed for this uh, one piece coveralls in navy Aha, uh -huh. you know I need this kind of thing because I don't know if I've shown you on the, on the video, but I actually managed to tear the entire leg out of my work trousers the other day. I caught them on the bumper of the ro Rover. Gosh, waterproof and windproof by the look of it. Wow. Oh, that'll be very useful. You've all seen me struggling in the rain, I guess, <laughs> with a hood. That is absolutely genius. It's like a hazmat suit for working in the garage. If the bomb drops, I'll be safe with that. That's brilliant. So I can be warm and dry. That is absolutely fantastic because the uh, the timber merchant keeps saying they can't get the six meter long length of wood I need for building the carport and the um, the farm units I've, I've got my name down for seem to be taking forever to happen. So uh, yeah, that's fantastic. I'll definitely be uh, making the most of that. Uh, it, the British weather will <laughs> be uh, ideal for that. Thank you very much indeed, Max. That's brilliant. You can clearly see my needs before I can. Right, let's see what else is in the garage. I, you know, I, I felt the padded envelope, I was thinking, this is gonna be Wish, isn't it? But that's thankfully not a crazy T-shirt with many rude slogans on it, but that's actually something astonishingly useful. So you know this has been a very good junk in the trunk so far this week. Next we have, uh, okay. Furious driving, uh, come from a, a print shop place. So let's see what we've got in this one. Ah, Robert, sorry, I didn't reply to you, Robert. You sent me an email and I forgot to reply. I went off to go and hunt out the, the, um, the serial number on the, uh, on the C5 and I completely forgot to go and get it to you because I took a photo of it and by the time I'd taken a photo of it and walked back, I'd, something else had happened and I completely forgot. This is from Sublime Print. Um, find those guys. They've got all the decals for the front of the Sinclair C5. That's super useful. We've also got... That's why he's asking about my serial number. I didn't realize that. I thought there were some differences for the different thing. I'm gonna have to ask you to remake that with the, uh, the new details of the motor, because I need to go, <laughs> that'd be really cool. That is so good. Thank you, Robert, that's brilliant. Robert Bryce, Sublime Print, thank you. He actually sells these on eBay, so you can go and buy new decals for your C5 to keep it looking fresh and new. Um, so Robert, if you send, send me the listing details, I'll, I'll retweet them for you. That is brilliant. That is going to make that C5 looking good. I've got two batteries for it now. There's a question about C5, so I'll tell you all about that in a, in a couple of minutes. Now, creak. What else have we got in here? We have got from Furious Driving 477. Where's the knife gone? We have got, oh, another an envelope in an envelope. Aha. After my disaster of losing three ARP manifold studs down the back of the engine on the floor, uh, I did find them in the end, but these are some spares in case I mess up again. I nearly said a rude word then. Hi Matt, here are some spare ARP bolts and gaskets for Rover V8, which was in a TVR head. Ah, car is gone, but still have a TVR, but it's a straight six engine. Don't lose them, <laughs> regardless Richard. <laughs> I won't Richard, thank you Richard Dell. Put those somewhere very safe indeed. I'm gonna put them back in the Rover so that they don't get lost. But yes, I am a clumsy fool, so spare things of everything 
are always extremely useful. Right, where are we? Do I think we're getting through these things? There's only three more items to go. Now this one, there's no return addresses there. Always careful of not showing return addresses. Um, it says fragile, so we're super duper careful getting into this one. Ooh, this looks like some kind of banner. Haha, -ha. it's a furious driving banner. And a Volvo banner, and an Alpha banner, and a Rover banner. Oh my gosh, this is brilliant. I need to read that letter in a second, find out who this is from. This is incredible stuff. Oh, this needs to find a home in the garage here somewhere, doesn't it? I can't sell a Volvo now, can I? <laughs> That is amazing. So I wonder where you found the logo. Was it just downloaded off the internet? Oh, brilliant. Hello, Furious Driving. I had this banner made up for your garage wall. Hope you like it. I do. I like it a lot. Uh, from David Vickers, North East England. Thank you, David. That is absolutely awesome. Where can I put this? I need to find somewhere. I need to find a home for this. Oh, I can stick it over the News of the World sign. That is so good. Oh, I'm going to find someone to make sure it's prominent. That is astonishingly good. Where on earth did you get this made? That's gobsmackingly good. Now it's got a sort of vinyl-y smell. I could smell a funny smell. I thought, I hope someone's not sent food and I've not opened it for like four days. <laughs> Creak. Okay, we now have something which worryingly has warning labels on it. Toiletry or medicinal aerosols. A little Monty Python sketch when the guy goes into the uh, the Swedish chemist. I would like a deodorant, ball or aerosol. No, for my armpits. And he works with a terrible accent. Right, I'm in. I'm in. Ah, heavy duty under seal. Aha, this is interesting. Current, uh, durable, high impact protective coating against corrosion, water, stones, and salt. Aha, I have many cars that need under seal, so that's a useful item. In, in researching and looking into under sealing stuff this week actually because I've got many cars to do. Hi Matt, so in the near future you're going to be under some of your cars. You might, as you might know, spray under seal can be terrible for clogging and not spraying very well. The traditional under seal just goes flaky and falls off. Yeah, that's, it's a minefield of trying to find the right product. Um, I worked for a decent Land Rover main dealer for a while that actually cared for their vehicles, which did include under sealing vehicles before handing them to the customers. So that's a good idea because the old defenders did used to rot a bit. Um, they still do. I imagine they can hear them crinkling in the distance if you're not careful. This is the stuff they use and I've used ever since. Oh, okay, um, try it and you'll never use anything again. If you buy it in bulk, boxes of 10, get it for original price. Adam Turpin. Oh, thanks, Adam. That is really interesting. You know, I've not come across, this is uh, Silver Hour brand. I've never come across this. Not, not seen this before. No, not, no, certainly not Silver Hour, Silver Hook. So yeah, this is a brand I've not seen previously. I actually need to do Quentin before it gets sold. I need to do all of the Volvo because that's in good condition. I want to keep it in good condition. The Red Mini needs doing. Um, I'm sure something else needs um, under sealing as well. So yes, I need I need vats of under seal for all the cars. And it's like the fourth bridge. You need to be going over it every couple of years. As well. well, anyway, that's interesting. I'll give that a try and see how we go. Uh, do we need to be painting this beforehand? Um, I imagine you do. I imagine you need to put some kind of hard coating on first and a follow up with that. That's very interesting. Thank you. I'll give that a go. Maybe maybe not today. It's a bit, a bit grotty today, but maybe tomorrow. And last of all, we have another one, which is a heavy one, which has come from. Tim Cox in Australia. And it says old car number plates on it, so I'm guessing it's old car number plates. <laughs> now we're in. So I so say thank you, first of all, to Tim, who's been a previous contributor to, to Junk in the Trunk, which is absolutely amazing, because it's the far side of the planet. So getting this stuff over here is a big endeavor. Well, first of all, oh, hello. The A to Z of number plates in South Australia. Before we even get into that, we've got history and information. So all about how you can have different plates, oh, Grand Prix plates, Jubilee plates. So the Grand Prix plates were issued in 1985, first of all, to, us, to commemorate the first Australian Formula One Grand Prix. These plates are available in a series of number 200 to 5,000. Jubilee plates for 1985 and 1986 uh, states Jubilee year. That's very interesting stuff, actually. I'll put this on, on Twitter and Facebook later on, because that's information, again, that I was not aware of. Uh, covering letter. Hi, 
Enjoy all the videos and after seeing the mailbacks on the 26th April, I decided to send some number plates I've collected over the years but don't have the space to display my help fill out the wall and a leaflet of A to Z of number plates explaining why 346J, this one here, was issued. Ah, okay. I'm gonna have to read this and find out. This is from Tim. Thank you, Tim. That is absolutely brilliant. Right, a bit of number plate. I've lost my leaflet. There we go. Oh, here we go. So 346J is one of the the Jubilee plates. Here we go. Underneath the uh, the picture of the bird, we've got the words 1836 South Australia 1986, and they're celebrating the Jubilee year in 1986. And the plates are available in the following series: 001J to 999J and 001S to 999S. They may be transferred to other vehicles. That is interesting stuff. Again, there's a whole world of information about number plates. Number plateology is something you could easily put in a rabbit hole on. So, Tim, you did a great job holding those together. It's actually quite a hard job undoing them. So first of all, we have got the 346J South Australia Jubilee plate. This is something I've never seen before. So I've quickly taken the camera off the tripod stand just to get a better look at these things. So this is the South Australia Jubilee edition from 19... 86, which is an interesting thing I did not know was uh, a thing that existed at all. So it's the bird logo, is that the South Australian uh, symbol by any chance? I, I don't know enough about this, I need to do some more learning. We've also got this one which is very, very interesting, 9961TD from December 1994. This is SA Trader, so I'm assuming SA Trader means it's a, a car dealer plate. So you want to see the, for sending people out on test drives perhaps, or for moving cars between dealerships and workshops and stuff. It's very heavy, this pressed steel, pressed metal, and it's really, really heavy heavy weight and there's also a name and address in the back of this and a phone number so presumably if this were taken off a car or a car got pulled over without the dealer in it the details are on the back of the number plate handwritten though I'd, I'd flip it over but it's someone's personal details and we've got VPU 941 which is a New South Wales plate no year on it though that's interesting no details on the back either um, but yeah interesting like in America the different states have got different colours, different fonts and logos. So this one, it's got the crown and it's got the Southern Cross. So uh, this is Victoria on the move. I, I don't know what year this uh, looks kind of 1980s-ish again. The font and everything looks very 1980s, but uh, there's a, oh, 41196, so 1996 perhaps. Don't know if you can make that out at all. Just there, that might be too, too tiny. That's interesting. So, oh, 1996 is 25 years old. It's, it's weird to think that's a quarter of a century already. Now this one, Federal Interstate. Now I don't understand what this one would be. I'm hopefully there's some information on that leaflet. Uh, nothing on the back of it. Does this mean this is purely for, for trucks that are going long distance between states? I don't see why you wouldn't have one number plate that allowed you to travel between states anyway. Very interesting, very curious. Also interesting how the... Um, the different states have got different numbers of letters. Well, those are the same, but the interstate one's different. Okay, and this one, Tasmania. I didn't know Tasmania was known as the Holiday Isle. It's a big learning experience today, but this one's got the same configuration of numbers and letters as, almost, as the federal interstate. Well, this is interesting. Oh, this is a real, real interesting find. Thank you so much, Tim. This is really cool to see all these a different world of number plates. This is a, a big jump up, because like in America, we've got all the different states of of the Union. Um, we've got a lot of different states and areas of Australia as well, which is, uh, you don't necessarily realize that they're different um, number plates for different, or different registrations, I should say, for different parts of the country. So this is a, a big thing. This is another development. This, this wall is gonna get even bigger. There's maybe multiple walls of number plates by the time we're done. So that's everything, that's all the packages open. That is an amazing junk in the trunk this month. Thank you everybody who has sent anything in at all. What an incredibly eclectic collection of stuff. If you've got anything else for next month, then do send it into the PO Box 477 in the, uh, in the listing below. Very much appreciate it. I hope everyone has enjoyed taking a look at this stuff as well. As I've opened it, I'll stick some of the stuff on Twitter and Facebook. Now, that's the end of part one, now part two. 
Now the Q&A bit of the video. This is the where the patrons and channel members send in questions for me to answer here right now. Uh, normally this is only for Patreons and channel members, however I did make a minor, minor foobar um, this month when I accidentally set it to public rather than to members only for about five minutes on the video. So when someone asked the question, was this meant to be for members only, the answer was yes it was. Sorry. So if you're not a channel member or a Patreon and don't know what it is, it's basically supporting the channel, a uh, very small uh, little thing each month just to help all the um, projects keep going and be funded to, to work. So there's a link description below if you maybe want to help out. Sort out the uh, the Rover 200 convertible being done, the um, many other projects which are all constantly in need of <laughs> in need of help. Now of course the printer is broken again so working off the screen of the laptop. Um, you may have noticed many of the stickers, Alpha, T-Shelf, Furious Driving and Rover in Japanese because of the Honda tie-up uh, adorning the laptop. Now, first question from Rob. Rob was watching one of my Modern Classics reviews. Got me thinking about his dad. He always bought Vauxhalls because there's a good dealer in the local market town. Never bothered looking at any other cars and every year a new Victor will be on the driveway replacing the old one. Did 20,000 miles a year, which is a lot in the old days. Now all those market town dealers are either gone or going. Now, do I agree that's the way forward and you just have to travel to the nearest big um, city for servicing? For him, that's a 50 mile round trip. Well, do you know what? I think it's kind of, the way they're trying to do it is get it more to online buying. So if you look at some of the things like Sayat, they've done a thing where it's it's like menu packages for the car. So a lot, instead of lots of different options, you buy by the package or buy pre-built cars or even. So I think they're actually trying to, in a way, get rid of the dealers as much as they can, make it out of town and even just online. So yeah, the days of, of actual dealers could well be numbered. Um, it's a funny way that the business is going, but everything is online these days. I think maybe the manufacturers have realized that throughout the pandemic, they were still selling cars when people couldn't go and test drive them. So why bother having a dealer network? Just needed somewhere to deliver and drop off or even just deliver straight to from a central hub. Um, that kind of seems like maybe that's what they're trying to do, which is a shame because I personally, if I was buying a new car and I'd never driven one, I would want to sit in the thing. I would want to take one for a test drive. I know there are things like the, the shopping center dealers like Tesla and Hyundai, I've got them in blue water. So you can go and sit in the car in the shopping center and then arrange a test drive from the car park, which is an interesting way of doing it. And people seem to, people who are not car people seem to quite like that. So yeah, perhaps maybe that is the way things are going. Okay, this is from Chisel Chin Jim. Uh, what kind of music do I listen to? And do I listen to different genres of music depending on what car I'm in? Um, and also, when will the first Furious Driving social meet happen? And will the Rover be the one to make the trip on its maiden voyage or will the Mercedes be ready? ready? Um, well, first of all, uh, all kinds of music. I mean, really, really, really varied. I mean, I've been into um, rock, metal, blues, indie, all sorts. I mean. So yeah, the last album I bought yesterday was actually Arlo Park's um, album. Uh, before that, I was in charity shop and I got Rhapsody in Blue on vinyl, uh, the Gershwin jazz thing. Uh, prior to that, I got some um, uh, like Jimi Hendrix. So yeah, different songs for different moods, endless, endless styles and endless interests. I, well, the last band I actually saw live before um, the, the lockdown was a French electro funk group called Caravan Palace. So yeah, I think it's quite an eclectic range of musical tastes I have. Uh, I think it's not so much the different cars that affect what I'm listening to, but different mood and where I'm going and what I'm doing. If I'm filling a long drive, then, then long music works quite well because you don't have lots of short music. Uh, but I did always find when I was driving it as a daily driver, the Rover 2000 did seem to run better if I was listening to Eric Clapton or, or Jimi Hendrix. I can't explain that, but it did seem to. Maybe it's just too loud to uh, hear any rattles and clanks. Uh, first Furious Driving Social Meet. Oh, I'm going to have to do that this year, aren't I, really? Um, I don't know when that's going to be or where that's going to be. Uh, I started looking at that like 18 months ago and then everything shut down and I kind of forgot about it. So I'm thinking maybe somewhere like Brooklands, if they would let us do it there, perhaps it would be quite good. Not exactly central, but it's in the central south area or somewhere up on the north of the M25, so it's kind of in the middle of the country-ish. Uh, might be quite good. But yeah, I don't think either of these two cars would be going. Uh, the Mercedes has got quite a lot more to do to it. I think the more I dig into it, the more I'm going to find. So I don't think that's going to be a short-term project by any means. This thing, maybe it'll run. Maybe if I was going to do the meeting actually here in my drive, this would be fine. <laughs> but probably it'll be the Volvo or the Alfa or the Rover Coupe. More than likely would be the car that went. Just because this thing will still be very, very new and I would want to give it a bit more of a shakedown before I try and risk having somewhere other people are coming to as well and then the thing wouldn't run 
all broke down. Next, um, hi Matt, just want to know what your favorite car on the fleet is to work on. Also, how do you keep track of all the jobs you need doing? Uh, I see Hubnuts has got folders on his fleet and wonder if I was had a similar thing. Um, yeah, Hubnuts folders are only because of Miss Hubnuts. Mr. Hubnuts does not have folders for anything. Um, a favourite car on the fleet, probably to work on, would be the Rover 2000. I just know it so well after so many years. It's very, very easy to work on. And it doesn't take many tools. It's simple and you can normally figure things out quite easily. I like working on that car. Apart from if it's welding or the back brakes, it's no fun at all. Followed really by the Rover Tomcat. That's just another easy car to, to do stuff on. It's a modern car that feels old, if that makes sense. You can kind of feel your way through most jobs. Um, how do I keep track of everything? It's all, it's all up here. I did start writing a, whoops. I did start writing like a sheet, like a blackboard sheet. But it's, even a sheet this big kind of got too small. Then I lost it behind the car. And uh, yeah, it kind of got out of date quite quickly. Um, so yeah, I mean, the back end rust has been taken off for over 2000. The front end rust is is doing yeah, there's, there's lots. And also when you sit all up there, it just gets depressing. So I just kind of focus on what he's doing immediately. Um, but, 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 can't wait to see Quentin finished. Hopefully that will be very soon. That was Will Welch. Th thank you, Will. I do appreciate that. Um, hi, Matt. Hope you're well. What are the chances of Mrs. Furious's cars? Next one being an EV, whether it's a Mini or otherwise, from Julian in Hamburg. Well, I'm um, not quite sure on that really. It depends what the range happens in the next few years. I think she has decided that her Mini Clubman that she's got um, is going to be like a long-term car. She wants to get out of the three-year cycle of having a car for three or four years, handing it back and doing it all over again, and constantly being in debt to the manufacturer. I think she wants out of that. So I think when that car is at the end of its PCP, she's going to get another loan out and just pay it off until, and drive it until it dies. So probably in that case, that's going to be quite a few years away. So potentially her next car may well be an EV because she likes to buy a car that's relatively new and just run it forever rather than me buying a car that's several years old and then getting bored and flipping on again. Um, so he potentially she will, not really because she wants to be like a environmentally good because you know, the, the debate about how good battery cars are is, is endless. But I think by the time she actually changes that, maybe that'll be her only option. I don't know actually. Um, but things like her parents live in up on the east coast and where they live it's quite remote and we, I looked at doing an EV drive up there and to fully charge an EV generally takes nine, ten hours, like a proper overnight charge off a main socket and there's only one fast charger within about ten miles of their house and then there's nothing for about twenty miles before that. So if that one charger wasn't running when you got there in an EV and that is on the absolute limit of most EVs range to get from our house to their house, then you'd be absolutely sunk. So from that point of view, unless EV technology improves a lot, uh, I, I don't imagine her next car will be an EV unless she hangs on to that Mini for another, what, nine years. So probably not. I mean, at the moment, EVs are good, just not quite right for us. This is kind of related actually to the next question from, uh, from Mark. I'd be interested in your, on your views on whether buying a diesel car with a new or used is a sensible decision today. The question is driven by, not driven by the 2030 cutoff for new ICE vehicle sales, rather it's driven by the fact that more and more towns and cities are bringing in emission taxes and restrictions. I mean, driving a diesel even before 2030 could become prohibitive. Well, that is an interesting question actually, and something I've found that taking my daily car as a 10 year old Mercedes, that I can't go into a lot of areas without paying a big fee on it. So the side effect of that is gonna be that gradually those kind of cars are gonna get a lot cheaper. They're going to be devalued quite heavily because people aren't going to want them. People in towns are going to be selling them off and people who need to drive into the towns won't want to need them. However, they are still brilliant. If you live in the countryside, if you do a lot of motorway driving, if you tow stuff or carry a lot of loads, then those diesels are absolutely perfect because they can go a long way on not much fuel. Um, they can take a lot of weight. They can tow a lot of weight. So I think there's still a need for them, but you need to be choosing carefully. For me, I spent a lot of time on the motorway, I spent a lot of time in the countryside, so a diesel estate is still absolutely fine. On the rare occasions I do need to go into town, it's usually for work, so I can then tell a client and just bill the customer as part of the job, or take the Mini because that's allowed in. I had to go into a job in a low emission zone, um, and Mrs Furious was home that day, so I borrowed the Mini and the Mini took me in. So 
Yeah, there is place for them, but yeah, if you live near a town or in a town, then obviously that's going to be an issue, and it, it is going to be make them, I guess, harder to sell as new cars, and certainly perhaps harder to sell as second-hand cars. But if you do a lot of motorway driving, then you can get an absolute bargain. Just be aware that you won't be able to take it everywhere. Uh, this is a bit of a tongue-in-cheek uh, question from Nigel. Um, am I after a Draper sponsorship? Because there is quite a lot of Draper product around the place. I haven't even used some of this stuff yet. This is uh, quite a fun thing. This is a multi-rail, which I need to go and sort out all my many random bits of old collections of, of different sizes of, of socket onto. Um, I'm not after a, uh, a Draper um, sponsorship. That'd be nice though. Um, what I'm after, or what I do, if you look in the link in the description below, as always, there's so many of those things. There are links to all the tools that I'm using and you can go and buy them off Amazon. I would prefer to use uh, like an independent retailer, but because this is a global thing, people watching all over the world, Amazon's kind of the only way you can put one link that hits the entire planet. If you click on that link and buy one of those tools, then I get a small um, referral fee, which helps fund the channel. And the thing is, I know that Draper is good stuff, so I'm not referring people to stuff that isn't going to last, is going to break, or is going to get ripped off. So I do know that, that Draper is good product. And the, uh, what I'm trying to sort out is like, a, if you watch Car Wizard's channel, he's got like a proper uh, homepage on Amazon where you can see all the stuff he uses. So I can then recommend stuff that I know I've used it. I know it's gonna be good. Um, I've not actually broken any uh, any Draper stuff yet. So I think it's pretty good quality. Um, so I think I'm, I'm sort of happy to recommend it, if that makes sense. So yeah, if you do look at the, the links below, you can see a lot of the stuff that I'm putting here in my garage and you can, you can see it as well. Also slightly tongue in, in cheek. Did it feel good beating Hubnut to drive a tall but match of Rancho? Do you know what? I thought Matt, uh, Hubnut had already driven a Rancho. I thought I'd seen a thumbnail to one of his videos with a beige Rancho in it. So I thought I was playing catch up and I was kind of leaving it a bit of a gap before I did one. So I thought I was being, yeah, being, being kind of polite by, by leaving a gap. So, well, I suppose it is quite a bit of a coup to, to jump there first. It's a slightly bigger channel, but you know, it's just the luck of the draw really, isn't it? He's, got a car he's putting out this weekend he says he's kind of quite jealous about that so swings and roundabouts it's actually a car i know and i was hoping to get to drive before he drove so never mind <clears throat> so other car question from nigel the mercedes estate and volvo are keepers you're lucky with the merc no problems great for work and touring who cares it's reliable so uh lucky so and so and the volvo has got to be a channel favorite or is it well the Volvo does seem to be a channel favourite. I mean, it's the last car in, well, apart from Quentin. Um, but it's not a car I was looking for because I've already got a big saloon in the Rover 2000. I've already got a big saloon in the V8 Rover. I've already, already got a big saloon in the W123. It's not a car I was looking for, but it's a car I found I do quite like. However, if one was going to be sold, um, that would be a sensible one to sell because I've had a few emails from people who are interested in buying it. Um, almost as soon as I got the car, people were saying, if you're ever selling that, please give me a shout. So it wouldn't be a problem to move it on. Um, I don't want to move on because I do like it. And it is, I think you're right, it is a channel favorite. I get so many comments on, and, and likes on that car that people absolutely love it. So I do feel like I'd be shooting myself in the foot content wise if I were to get rid of it. But um, there's only a few more things to do to it. You know, it actually goes on to say about how about doing a DAB install on the Volvo or a sat-nav update on the Merc. Well, the Merc does need a sat-nav update. Uh, the DAB install would be tricky because the I'm, I'm, I've got a video actually coming out on this as soon as I get around to doing it. Uh, I've got all the bits in the car. Doing an, a head unit install on the Volvo is tricky because of the shape of the dashboard. Even a standard... Um, the old Sony I've got in there, when you go into first and third and fifth, you bang your knuckles on it and you change the radio station. Um, so you have to be really cautious about anything you put in there, like a, a DAB will probably be touch screen potentially, and so that'd be awkward as well. So I don't know if DAB will be possible in that car just because of the shape of the dashboard, but we'll figure something out. There's gonna get an audio upgrade on it though next week, hopefully. And yeah, I'm looking at doing some kind of upgrade on the Volvo, on the Mercedes, the new Mercedes because that sat is terrible. It's left me really in the lurch. It put me 13 miles from my destination on Thursday. Anyway, next question from Tony. Enjoying the content? Are you any closer to getting the Rover V8 running? Any progress on the Sinclair C5? Rover V8, um, do you know what? The, since I did the last video, I've had loads of non-YouTube work in, plus I've had to um, do the, the drives we've seen as well. And so I haven't had time to go back on this. I, a couple of suggestions from uh, Nitro Sylvia about things I can try. I'll try and get back onto that this week. It's, I'm very cautious now because that oil pump hasn't worked. I'm even more ner nervous than I was before of putting a foot wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm almost tempted to trailer off to my friend's garage and just let him make it start because then at least I know it's going to run and not kill itself. 
Sinclair C5, I need to do another video on that. Um, I kind of put everything on hold because the batteries weren't turning up and they didn't turn up and didn't turn up for weeks and weeks. And then one turned up and I thought, great, I can finally do it, but it didn't come with a charger, so that's not gonna work. And then suddenly two days later, the second battery arrived with a charger with the wrong connector, but we can, we can cut that off and make that work. Um, then I went to go and mount everything up together and sort of build it all and found that the sprocket gear was different chain link size. The, the gear teeth didn't mesh with the uh, the bike chain. So I've had to go and figure out what size bike chain that is and then buy a sprocket that hopefully will fit on there. So I'm waiting on Amazon again to try and get a bike chain. I think I'm probably going to have to go and buy several sprocket wheels to go on the motor. It's, it's, it's one of those things because everything is not off the shelf. Everything is making up as I go along. It's, it's taking longer than I planned. But at least we've got stickers now. We now have stickers for it, so that's, that's good. Right, next question from Davey, Scottish Car Enthusiast TV. Davey, I must find a place to... You know, I need a smooth surface in this garage so I can stick stickers up. We sometimes see you partner up with Mr Lloyd of Lloyd's Vehicle Consulting, either driving one of his fleet or Mr Lloyd driving one of my fleet. Uh, so who approached who? Was it Mr Lloyd needed a videographer or were you looking for a car to review at the time and Mr Lloyd offered one to review? Uh, he approached me... Um, because he wanted, he had seen my Alfa Giulietta review after he had done a uh, Chrysler Delta review, which is the same car under a different badge. Um, he wanted to drive my Tomcat, and also he wanted someone to film him driving something else, because he, yeah, he employs a videographer for his videos. And so that's how we met, and I filmed his MG3 while he drove my Rover Tomcat, so I filmed him and I filmed myself. And after that, we went off and did a few other of each other's cars and then did the Santa Pod Challenge when I had the Hyundai Coupe. That's how, how we met during that. And we've carried on doing things ever since the most recent being the VW ID3, where I filmed him driving the car and I then drove the car myself as well. Um, so that was an interesting car to drive for the ID3. But it's been, yeah, but it's been quite a, a, a nice friendship we've formed over the last, uh, well, two years. It's 2019, so nearly two years now. Now, next question. Okay, this is a bit of a, an awkward one from Michael. Uh, a few months ago, I promoted a workshop manuals from eManual Online. Um, since it's not impossible to get a paper manual for the diesel version of my Kia Rio, I decided to get one. Um, what he wasn't warned about was file download was 29 gig and it took like 10 hours to download, yeah. So yeah, basically it's had some technical problems and it's been a bit of a nightmare. I did 80 emails with the company and they're not answering that. I'm very sorry about that because I've emailed them a couple of questions and they've come back straight away to me. Um, because what actually happens with the e-manual online, I've actually not updated the um, the link below because they've changed how they their, their delivery server and I've not updated the links yet. Because um, so I didn't download it. I just did it as a online thing. What, what it is, it says here, a virtual computer. So you, you open a window in your browser, Safari or whatever else, and um, it then opens up a... A, a PC, a virtual PC, and you use it online. Now I've got pretty quick broadband here, so I didn't have any problems. And also the Wi-Fi extends out here to the garage. So I didn't have any issues with this. I actually didn't even know you could download it. And then 29 gig is not surprising because if you've got like a 400 page document with illustrations, that is gonna take a lot of, of data. And obviously the download time depends on your on your broadband speed. Although I didn't actually have to install a virtual, you said you had to install a virtual computer to access the menu. I didn't in install anything, it just literally opened up as a window. Um, so I'm not quite sure why, why you all said you had to install something. Uh, and then, yeah, well, then you had login problems as well. That sounds like it's gone quite, quite unfortunately badly wrong. So I'm very, very sorry about that, Michael. I don't know how that's happened or why that's, that's occurred that way. Uh, but I've just, I didn't have, I didn't have any of those issues. I just opened up the window and, and there it was and scrolled through the menus and, and went to the page I was looking for. So, and then I actually, by chance, someone sent me the Alpha 145 manual on the CD-ROM. It turned out to be exactly the same manual. The official factory manual on the CD-ROM was the same one I've been using online um, from eManual. So it was the correct manual, it turned out as well. So I don't know why you've had those problems. I'm very sorry to hear that though. Um, but I, I can't comment because I didn't have any issues. I, I just opened up and it worked. And I've only ever used it on Wi-Fi. I've never downloaded it. So, I mean, 29 gigs are a lot to be installing on a computer anyway. That's quite a big chunk of your hard drive to, to devote to it. So all I can say is I didn't have any problems and I'm sorry you did. Now, just two more questions. Now, first of all, would you import a 1989 Cadillac Brougham d'Elegance to this country? Um, I don't know if, if I liked one enough. I'm, I've looked at importing cars from America before. The problem is the cost is quite high. Not the import, that's one to two thousand pounds, give or take, depending whether you're coming from uh, east coast or west coast. And 
obviously um, the, the shipping company you're using. Uh, 89, you should be old enough not to have too many uh, import duties on that either, because I was looking at a post-2000 car and the import duty and tax were, were quite prohibitive, and that's why I didn't do it in the end. Um, if I liked one enough, I don't see why not. Um, they're not talking about stopping having petrol cars being allowed, you're just not allowed to register any new ones from 2030, so maybe we'll do it now rather than waiting so you can have it on the road before any potential legislation in the future. So yeah, if you like it, go for it. Uh, I don't think a Cadillac Brougham would be my personal choice. I would we'll probably go for something like a big old station wagon or a Corvette C4 or a, or a Crown Vic. <laughs> but if you're into Cadillacs, then absolutely go for it. That was from Robert Foster. Last question of the week, or the month even, from Frank. Two questions. We were talking about doing some rust proofing on several cars. Will you do one or more videos about it? I'm interested in how you do it and what products I'll use. Second question, what are the chances I'll build a kit car in the future? Well, first question, rust proofing, I'm still looking into that. Basically, there is so much information out there and so much of it is contradictory that you're right, it is very confusing. Um, I've never come across this particular underseal product. Um, before, but I'm going to give that a try. I had been looking at getting some built hamber stuff because what I think generally you want to be doing is putting on a hard coat of some kind of rust proof paint and then under sealing with an under seal like a stone chip guard like that and it's all got rust proofing. Um, but yeah that's going to be, I am going to do a video on that because I've got three cars that all need doing so um, yeah. I mean I've been using the comma under seal which has got a very good reputation as well so I'm told built hamber is extremely good, so I'm going to look into built hamber. I've also used um, I've also used Pour 15 in the past, which is very very tough as well. But it does chip a little bit easily. Um, it leaves a lovely nice shiny surface. But then I used it on the engine bay of the V8, and the whole lot went to crinkle finish, which it shouldn't have done. So I had to sand that all off again, which is an absolute nightmare because it's rock hard. So yeah. Um, yeah, I'm still not 100% sure on this, so I'll come back to you with an actual video very shortly indeed and um yeah but i think probably built hamber with my my choice if as well as the, the silver hook which is a new one on me uh finally what's the chance i'll build a kit car in the future you know, i hadn't thought of building a kit car i mean there's lots out there um but i've kind of got so many problems with with cars that aren't kit cars are actual cars <laughs> that i've never given it a thought but you know it's an, it's an idea isn't it and there are some quite interesting ones out there. I don't think I'll go for like a recreation of an actual car. You know, the, the Lancia Stratos type copies. Maybe some kind of catering thing might be quite fun. Maybe a challenge to see if I could build one in, in under a weekend or something like that. Who knows? Never rule it out. I've not planned to it, but I don't know. I've just realized this is number plate says UK on it as well. I didn't notice that before. There's a German number plate with UK on it. <laughs> All oh, right. Okay. Well, thanks very much indeed for watching, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed this Q and A session, and of course, the junk in the trunk. We've got a myriad of exciting things. I'm actually looking forward to some rain now. I've got some waterproof overalls. I'm gonna have to shift this over and stick some stuff on the wall. Um, thank you for watching. If you have enjoyed this, please do hit like and subscribe. And as I said at the beginning of the last one, if you didn't like this kind of thing, don't hit dislike and unsubscribe. Just don't watch it. So, thank you very much indeed, and join me again very soon for actual tinkering stuff and the end of next month again for another junk in the trunk q a if you want to become a channel member or patreon then hit the links in the description below and you'll be able to access the email address to send in the questions and if you want to send anything into junk in the trunk the address as always is missing furious driving junk in the trunk p.o box 477 aylesford me69le and i'll see you again very soon thanks for watching